Okay, so good afternoon everyone again. And this is Dr. Sanjeev. Uh, I shall teach you literary criticism paper and in this lecture I am going to begin an introduction uh, to the romantic criticism. I also gave you some PDF. Uh, I expect that you have read them. At the same time, I also sent you some link of videos which would give you basic understanding of the romantic period. So hoping that you have read and you have watched the video and you have got at least basic understanding of what romantic period was and what romantic criticism is. It would be quite different from romantic literature, you see. In traditional uh, classes that I am teaching in BA2 or in MA1, wherever, I am teaching literature. And in this class, I am teaching criticism. So there is difference between literature and criticism. I hope that other teachers uh, may, ho may have, uh, you know, distinguished between literature and criticism, literature and theory. But in brief, I would like to let you know what is literature and what is criticism and how it is different from theory. Uh, so just for a uh, brief I mean, understanding of literature and theory and criticism, I am going to tell you what is literature. See, there is no exact definition of literature. We cannot exactly define what literature really is we may fail to come to the final definition. So all definitions, they are somewhere close to the real meaning, the real definition of literature, but they have some, you can say, failures. They don't deal with everything or every aspect of literature. So beginning with Sahir Ludhianvi's popular comment on literature what he sees i think you might have also read in popular literature paper that what he whatever he got in the form of experience from society he returned it into the form of words to the society itself so what is literature it is a kind of expression sharing experiences that a poet that a novelist that a dramatist has got from the society and he shares this experience in the form of words again in the form of words means novel poetry drama short short story anything so this is literature literature is a kind of imitation you might have also read literature as mimesis if you are studying plato and aristotle so whatever a poet experiences imitates from the real life and recreates into an imaginary world. I am just trying to define, maybe I am not fitting into the standard definition of literature, but I am trying to be close to what literature is. So literature is imitation. At the same time, it is an imaginary construct. It may have close relation with society, with reality, but it may not have, it is not necessary. Literature tells what it is, what it was, and what it might be. It shows possibility, a possible, brighter, better future, better society. It gives you visions of society. It reflects you the failures, the shortcomings, the bright aspects of the past. I don't say only failures, bright aspects as well. It delights as well as it teaches. But what is criticism? Criticism is the appreciation of literary work, such literature that is created through imitation, through mimesis, literature uh, brings criticism. So criticism is an appreciation. Always remember, we have different meanings of criticism. If you see Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary, it will tell you different meanings. So one meaning that we mean here, that we select here for our paper is the appreciation. We have to find good and bad into a literary work. 
and we have to judge the value of that literary work on the basis of what it really is. Just give me one minute. Okay, so what criticism is? It is an appreciation. It is a practice. It is an intellectual practice again of looking into a literary work, finding out its value, exploring different aspects, judging it by comparing it. There are so many things that a critic does and in that way he is going to decide the aesthetic value of that particular work. What is aesthetic value? Aesthetic value is padhne ke baad aapko pleasure feel ho. The most aesthetic work is one which gives you the most delight after reading. Aap kuch padhte hai to aapko padhne ke baad lagta hai na ki hume achha laga. That sense of feeling good that sense of feeling excited is called the aesthetic value. See, this aesthetic value is very subjective to reader and readers differ into their choice of what they delight and what they like. So, literature is the expression of society, it is the imitation of the real world and it is an imaginary construct, a fictional world and criticism that is an appreciation of that literary work, that imaginary world, that imitated world. But overall the purpose of literature is to give you ultimate pleasure, delight of reading, the aesthetic, the pleasure of reading. And this is the duty of a critic to establish this value of a particular text if it is there. Sometimes critics judge literary works, they try to explain what is the worth of that work, does this work qualify for universal value, critics also try to look at these things. A text, a literary work may not be universal into its approach but it delights you a lot. For example, popular literature, it is not universal. But there are some works, some literary works which have universal value. They have surpassed all restrictions of time and place, of conditions in which they were written. One good example is William Shakespeare. His plays, they are ultimate examples of the universal literary works. Not all, but many of them. You see Hamlet, Hamlet is as relevant as it was in the Elizabethan period. It is having the same relevant at present time. And why this relevance is established is understood or explored because of the critics. I will come to the politics of criticism at the end of this lecture or whenever I have finished this introductory session. But what Shakespeare is, he might have been forgotten and nobody had tried to see what Shakespeare was. But these are critics who tried to find out the aesthetic value of Shakespeare's plays, Shakespeare's sonnets and Shakespeare's poems. And they set the standard that Shakespeare stands here and these writers stand here. Or Shakespeare stands somewhere here and other writers or good writers stand somewhere here. So this is the value of a critic. This is the duty of a critic. And one more thing, a critic should not be biased. As Matthew Arnold is saying, criticism should be disinterested, 
what is disinterested? When the critic does not have any personal touch into his appreciation, no. He should not try to appreciate because the poet is his friend or because the poet is his enemy. So criticism needed a new dimension, especially into the Romantic period. And why this happened, I would come to that point as well. Like there were so many magazines and they were run by different parties, different groups of people. Some supported neoclassical period, I mean the poetic diction, style, classicist uh, following of the neoclassical period. Some supported new things, new experiments in poetry. So the critics who were running these magazines, they were you know, they were filled with their own personal biasness and they evaluated the literary works of romantic authors with their personal interests. So there should not be any personal interest into a critic when he or she is going to evaluate or appreciate a literary work of a, an author or a poet or a dramatist, whosoever. So I hope that you have got to understand where literature is and where criticism is. Literature is not criticism. It is sometimes people say that it is criticism of society, criticism of life. It may be as even Matthew Arnold is saying that literature is criticism of life. But true criticism, the literary criticism that we are studying here is an evaluation, an appreciation of literary work to judge its aesthetic, universal, moral values. All literary works, they have some moral values, sometimes defined, sometimes hidden. And these are the critics who explore these values and make easy for the readers, for the audience to understand that particular work. I give you one good example again. You read critical works. If you are given a poem, for example, The Rape of the Lock by Alexander Pope, and you are asked to read it by yourself, you may delight, you may not delight. You may understand what the poet wants to say through the poem. You may not understand, both are possible. When you are going to read critical, uh, you can say essays on that particular poem, now you will have good understanding what you are to look into that particular text, in that particular poem. And you will intentionally read that particular thing in that way. From the side of the critic, this job is done. A critic always has an intellectual exercise with a literary work to understand it, to explain it, to evaluate and appreciate it. And this kind of appreciation should always be disinterested, unbiased, impartial. Now we come to literary theory because you will read literary theory into your fourth semester and how you will distinguish between criticism and theory. See, literary criticism is what that tries to appreciate a literary work. If there is no literature, there is no criticism, remember that. So literature has a universal value, it has universal importance when we compare it with theory and literature and criticism. And criticism cannot survive without literature. If there is no literature, there is no criticism. That is why I said that. So literature is totally dependent, not sorry, criticism is totally dependent on literature. And it always tries to judge the value of literature. So criticism is 
coming from inside literature. So, criticism is given birth by literature. Now, we come to theory. Theory is an independent phenomenon. It is an independent discipline. Why? Because theory stands without literature. See, one example I give you. Suppose you are to read romantic criticism. If there were no romantic critics, okay, even then we can understand or we could understand romantic literature. At least we could delight it. But suppose if there was no romantic literature, so where did these romantic critics come from? Agar romantic critics na hote, to shayad hum romantic literature ko to bhi samajhte, to bhi delight karte, enjoy karte. Maybe not in that way, which we are doing right now, with the help of romantic critics. Lekin, agar romantic literature hi na hota, then it is not possible that romantic critics would have come. It is another matter that most of the romantic poets were romantic critics. Yes, most of the romantic poets, they were critics themselves and they explained their literary works, their ideas on poet, the language of poetry and the definition of poetry. Here is, a, here is an exception. But what about neoclassical criticism? What about Shakespearean criticism? If there was no Shakespeare, why there would be critics like uh, S. E. Bradley or G. Wilson Knight or any critic on William Shakespeare, even Coleridge himself. So, criticism cannot stand apart, cannot stand independently without literature. Literature is necessary. And why it is not having any ground because it is totally dependent on literature. Criticism appreciates literary work. If there is no literary work, it will not do any kind of appreciation. But theory is something abstract. It tries to find out whatever is hidden, whatever is exposed. It is also trying to find out, but it is trying to find whatever is hidden. In simple language, we can say criticism is more concrete into its own appearance. Like you try to see stanza form, you try to see simile metaphor or figures of speech, you try to see uh, the meaning produced through the order of sentences or logical conception of meaning. You understand everything. You don't try to find out deep philosophy into literature when you are doing criticism but when you are going to do uh, do with theory now you are not dependent on literature actually theory makes us understand better this particular literary work and it gives you even deeper meaning you can understand literature with criticism no doubt but when you have understanding of theory, you understand the minuteness, the subtleties of literary works, how they may overlap or they may be interdisciplinary. They may transcend the boundary of literature and become something more. Why theory is independent? and not dependent on literature because theory has its own application. See, theory borrows most of its principles from philosophy. Feminism is also a kind of philosophy. What is philosophy? I am not talking about philosophy as a subject. Here I am talking about philosophy as an abstract idea, a phenomenon which needs explanation and which does not exist. It is abstract. Whatever we see about the operation of women into our society, this is our own observation. But the construction of gender and sex, this is abstract, this is philosophical basis. 
that gender is culturally constructed, sex is biological. We study post-colonial literature. We see colonial empire. But the logic behind the operation, the exploitation is philosophical. The terms that we use, hybridity, subaltern, all these things. So theory stands itself alone. It has its own discipline. Sometimes it is borrowed from different other disciplines like psychoanalytic theory. If there is no literature, even then psychoanalytic theory can exist. If not on literature, then on human beings on the mind and behavior of human being. It is one way to interpret a literary text. But it is not totally dependent on literary text. You see any kind of literary theory. So theories have their own independent existence apart from literature. But criticism cannot stand without literature. So these are the things that I wanted to make you clear. What is literature? Maybe I have not covered all aspects of literature because it is quite difficult. Even for great scholars it is difficult to define literature. And also define criticism and theory. But at your level, at MA third semester level, I have tried to explain these things that, like what literature is or what is the area of literature, importance of literature and how its importance is established through criticism and how theory helps us understand in a better way these literary works. Now we come to the politics of criticism, politics of aesthetics. See when Shakespeare became a very popular dramatist during his lifetime, he was not known for his drama actually. He was known for his poems, the, those he writ, wrote, Venus and Adonis, Rape of Lucrece, and the sonnets that he composed. Though he earned so much money through theatre and drama, but he was not popular as a dramatist. See how Shakespeare's popularity grows, his own contemporary Ben Johnson. You might have read his name into criticism or into your history of English literature books. Ben Johnson was a later contemporary of William Shakespeare and Shakespeare acted into some of the plays of Ben Johnson. And Ben Johnson admired him, wrote a poem on Shakespeare, some views on Shakespeare, a preface to his poem. Then we have John Dryden. You might be studying John Dryden into your course. How Dryden is comparing Johnson and Shakespeare. See, if there was no Shakespeare, there was no Johnson, then how Dryden can write or base his argument on these two great authors. So this is criticism, that is why. And you have Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson preface to Shakespeare when he is writing. If there was no Shakespeare, why or how can Johnson write preface to Shakespeare? An essay of dramatic poetry, how would it be possible? And even Coleridge himself, he delivered series of lectures on Shakespeare and this is reality that these two critics, one Samuel Johnson, he tried to establish the identity of Shakespeare as Shakespeare who learned things from the book of nature as it is quoted into that book. And it is Coleridge who really established Shakespeare as Shakespeare. See who decides the value of literary work? Now I want to ask a question. Shakespeare lived in ignominy into his own lifetime not as a dramatist but as a poet. He was not known for his drama. First Dryden attempted to bring him into light as a dramatist and roughly after 100 years Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson attempted again to bring him into popularity and then 
uh, Coleridge into his lecture series, he again attempted to bring Shakespeare into popularity and in this course of roughly around 200 years, Shakespeare became Shakespeare, otherwise Shakespeare was nothing or just an ordinary author. And see one good example, John Donne, he is a metaphysical poet and you might be surprised to know that John Donne was never studied as a metaphysical poet before T.S. Eliot wrote an essay on metaphysical poets. See for about 300 years John Donne was not John Donne, he was an ordinary poet and he was forgotten. A critic comes and establishes that poet, establishes that author as a standard, as having universal value, defining the morals, values, importance of a particular text. So this is the politics. Criticism can make anyone popular and can make anyone, you can say, least popular or obsolete. Most of the literary works that we study right now and we call them canon, canonical literature we call them. Why do we call them canonical literature? Because most of the criticism is done on them. If you want to not make any pop, anyone popular, don't do any critical work on that particular author. He will never become popular. And this is the politics. One fine example is Dalit literature in India. Dalit literature was written by Dalits. In the beginning, some academics, they wanted to give benefit of writing on Dalit. So they wrote criticism and then they stopped doing criticism. And Dalit literature is least important literature in India. Because people discourage researchers to do research on Dalit literature. So see how politics works to make something popular, to make something unpopular. And Shakespeare is Shakespeare, but Thomas Kidd is not Thomas Kidd. Or he remains there as one of the ordinary authors or contemporaries. Even one good example I tell you, in the high modernism, the period after First World War, when modernist writing became very popular, and it was dominated by two poets only, at major level, W. B. Yeats and T. S. Eliot. And most of the other poets, they were also having modern sensibility, but they were not explored much as these two poets were explored. And they were rendered as only contemporaries, not modernist as uh, in real sense. At present, even T.S. Eliot and W.B. Yeats, they were considered modernists. Most of the other authors of that period, they are not called modernists, but they are called contemporaries. Yes, we are very popular, we are with us, yes, we are with us. Because they attracted much criticism to themselves and they did not promote that criticism to other people, other contemporaries. So criticism has this failure. Criticism says that it is unbiased, but into its own selection of pieces of works, it is biased, yes. And this is theory that removes this biasness. See, if you read history books, do you find mention of any Dalit, any common man, any ordinary person, any woman, it's uh, herself. Have you ever read any history of women? You read history of India, you read Ashoka Empire, I mean, whatever you call it, Mauryan Empire, Gupta period, XYZ period. Do you find women being mentioned in all periods, except that the wife of the king. Wo Raja ki Maharani thi, yehi naam likha hai. 
but this is theory that talks about the loopholes, the missing aspect. And it brings feminist history into context. That is why we need a history for women, because criticism, mainstream writing was confined to powerful people, whom we call great men. So theory does its job here. We need to find a history of common people, the exploited people, then subaltern studies. Whole history of India is written by foreigners. Then theory makes, her understand, makes us understand that we need to write our history. See, these are philosophical points. We see concrete history, but we see something missing, something abstract something absent and this is theory that makes us do this. So in general, I wanted to give this brief introduction of literary theory, literary criticism and literature itself. So I would like to finish this lecture here and discuss romanticism into the next class.